Welcome, everyone. I'm going to get started with our Top Core 2 workshop on ecological orchard pest and disease management. Next slide. And uh, I'm Phil. Uh, and with me tonight, also presenting, are Sharon, Corey, and Michael, all members of POP staff. Um, for those of you brand new to POP, we are a nonprofit that plants and supports community orchards in the city. We're celebrating our 15th year this year and uh, currently support 66 uh, orchard sites in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, but we're going to start with an intro to ecological pest and disease management so you can understand what our approach is. I do like to always start this workshop by saying that uh, we are not entomologists or plant pathologists. Uh, and most pop orchards are have had minimal uh, management in terms of spraying and things like that. We are here to share what we have learned over the last 15 years in terms of best practices in minimizing pests and diseases and uh, hopefully resulting in uh, the best harvests uh, possible. Um, but we're not necessarily expertise, we don't have necessarily have expertise on every single pest and disease issue. Uh, so, but we are going to cover holistic and organic management options, including both spray and non-spray options. We will be covering the most common pests we have seen in Philadelphia orchards and the most common diseases. Um, and we will uh, also share in the chat our, our resources page um, for this workshop, which includes links to a lot of more information. Um, and other resources that POP has developed for pest and disease management. I'm handing it off to Corey to kick us off. Yeah. All right, everybody, thanks again for joining us on this Tuesday evening uh, for Popcorn 2. And we're going to start off the conversation by just uh, talking about what is eco an ecological orchard. Um, to POP, what we define it as is a combination of practices from holistic, organic, integrated pest management and permaculture approaches. And a big thing that all of those have in common is viewing the orchard as a whole ecosystem, not trees as isolated plants or pests as isolated problems, but all of this within the larger context. And then finding balance within that ecosystem or within that con text. We're not trying to have no diseases and no pests within our orchard systems. We're not having a goal of complete control. What we want is good balance. We want to have healthy soils that feed healthy plants that can protect themselves um, within a healthy, healthy ecosystem. And what that looks like um, is a lot of preventative care over prescriptive care. There's kind of four different um, categories within this. The first one is design, which we're going to get more into in Popcorn 4 in two weeks, but it has to do with your plant selection, um, the soil health, the water drainage in the soil, uh, integrated or pest management and disease management starts right there. Um, and then also companion planting, which we're going to get into in just a couple minutes. Um, and then there's cultural controls, uh, modifying the growing environment to reduce pest establishment, to uh, reduce reproduction and dispersal, to reduce survival. Um, so those things are just the good practices that you should be doing. This You should be pruning, you should be thinning, you should be cleaning the orchard floor. That means getting any of the fruit that dropped. You wanna get that out of there. You wanna get off any mummies. That's that fruit that's still hanging on your trees right now from last year. All of these are cultural controls that you should be doing um, before you are doing anything else almost. Uh, then there's physical controls where you're uh, killing or removing the pests or diseases, or you're excluding them with a net or a trap or a fence. And we're going to get into all of those. Um, and then we'll have chemical, co chemical controls, um, both organic and holistic, and Phil's going to take us through that. So first off, uh, monitoring and identification. You should be doing at least weekly walkthroughs of your orchard. Are the buds beginning to break? Are the leaves, what do they look like? Are they getting deformed? 
are the fruits, do they have any marks on them? Is there any changes in the bark? Um, you wanna do this in the morning is the best when there's the most activity happening. And when I did this, I managed vegetable farms for a while. And we would say, if you see more than five pests on two or three plants in a row and you don't see any beneficials, then you know you're not in balance. You know you need to make some sort of intervention. And I think the same sort of thinking applies here. Um, because of course, again, we're not trying to have no pests at all. But when I see them, I pay attention. And I know that they start in pockets and then they spread from there. Um, and so I need to walk the whole orchard and I need to walk different paths around it. Um, if you don't monitor, you almost certainly will see a reduction in your uh, crops and maybe even a total loss. You'll see the spread of diseases as pests often are the vectors, they're the ones spreading them around. Um, and you'll see a buildup of your pest populations. So you need to do weekly walkthroughs. And then once you see something, you need to properly identify it. And here on the right side, we see uh, Pop has made a pest and disease guide featuring uh, the common fruits, apples, cherries, peaches, pears, and plums, um, and the common diseases and pest problems that we see with them. By fruit, we have uh, pictures and descriptions and life cycle descriptions of the pests and diseases. And then from there, you can check out our website, um, on our blog, we have detailed articles about each of these different pests and diseases and treatment options. Uh, this, this, uh, and this pest and disease guide is free for download from our website. And then on the left is a picture of Rodale's Natural Pest and Disease uh, Control Book, which we really love. Um, it gives uh, guidance not only on fruit, but also vegetables and ornamentals. It's really easy to use. Um, and just great all around, all organic um, tips for pest and disease control. So back into companion planting, when pop plants orchards, we don't plant just trees, we plant whole understories of perennial um, flowering crops to create that balanced ecosystem. Many of these or understory crops are medicinal to uh, enhance the uses of the orchard and they uh, offer season long bloom be between them because what we're trying to do with these is attract not only pollinators but also predatory insects and parasitic insects um, to create that ecosystem that we're looking for and in popcorn 4 we'll talk more about the specific uh, plant selections and design of companion planting uh, and so we were looking for those beneficial insects. Uh, the most infamous of them, of course, is the ladybug or the lady beetle, which is a great predator for aphids, especially uh, in its larval stage is when it's the uh, predator, really. It's this orange and black looking alligator type of um, picture. But we don't actually recommend releasing them one, because they're great that you have an infestation of aphids, you release them, they'll eat them, and then they leave. Um, and also there is some concern about their harvesting practices for lady beetles. So we don't uh, recommend their release. And then here on the bottom right, we have praying mantises, which are fierce predators. I've been lucky enough to catch one, see one catch a cicada, and then it ripped its head off. Um, very fierce. But the thing is, they're indiscriminate. They uh, eat both our pests and our beneficial insects. And so they kind of have a neutral effect in the end. And so uh, we also don't recommend releasing praying mantises. Um, besides, uh, in most of our orchards, we see a, a very healthy population of praying mantises. Uh, one that we would recommend is the trichobrama wasp here on the top right. Uh, they're tiny, tiny wasps, about four or five could fit on a pinhead, and they lay their eggs within moth eggs. Um, and then the moth eggs become black, and 10 days later, the uh, wasp emerges and they have pretty quick life cycles. So you can release them in your, at your site and hopefully establish a population there. Um, and they're really great for coddling moths specifically. 
Um, and then green lacewing, likewise, a great predator, both at larval and adult stage, uh, eating aphids, mites, scale, and mealybugs. And then besides uh, beneficial insects, we have avian allies. So think about poultry, not only chickens, but ducks and turkeys going through the orchard at specific times. Um, like right now, when there's larva under the trees, in the soil, larva and eggs overwintering, and you can, the chickens will go through, scratch it up, eat the larva, eat any insects that they have. Uh, they can be kind of hard on companion plantings, those understory herbal plants. Uh, they can rough them up pretty good. Uh, and you don't want to leave them in the orchard too long. They could just be too hard on the orchard floor, too much of that nitrogen rich fertilizer dropped everywhere. So you want to think about your timing and rotate them through. And then we also have songbirds here on the right. We have a bluebird who's an especially good predatory uh, bird for insects. They eat moths and larvae and caterpillars, and you could put a bluebird box to attract them into your site, uh, like waves, bats and bat boxes. And then there's predatory birds, uh, hawks who can hunt the rodents, the squirrels, um, and just kind of create this whole ecosystem that's working together. And then us getting involved, some physical controls of literally getting the, in, the pests out of our production. So there's uh, the shake method where we're just shaking the tree, right? Uh, when, the, um, when the plum cucurlio is, uh, when the fruits start to form on the tree, the plum curlio come up there and they're real clumsy. And so you want to spread bed sheets around the tree, shake it as hard as you can, and the plum curlio will fall off onto the sheets. You're going to gather them up and put it in soapy water. Um, and then almost just rinse and repeat as many times as you can um, from that for those two weeks. Um, and then there's also just spraying aphids, they come on the undersides of leaves um, and you can just get a hard stream of water from your hose and physically knock them off. There's also soil cultivation kind of mimicking the poultry going through the orchard. You could come through with a hoe and rough up the soil and kill any larva or overwintering eggs there. Um, we find this especially helpful for oriental fruit moth, OFM or coddling moth. And then pheromone traps and mating disruption. Uh, he, on the left, we see the white uh, triangle. That is a pheromone trap. And what happens is inside of there is a lure. When insects mate, the female puts out this uh, pheromone, the scent, and the males fly and find them and they mate. And so inside of this uh, white triangle, is a lure that has that scent. The male moth comes in, gets stuck, the, the, the bottom layer is sticky, and then we know that the mating flights have begun. And so then we know how to have good timing. We can release the trichogramma wasps or do certain sprays that we'll talk about later, but a lot of the pheromone traps are used to monitor, to know when to uh, do your treatments. It's so critical to have good timing when you do your treatments. You want to treat when uh, the insect is at their most vulnerable stage. Um, and if you miss your timing, you could really uh, waste a lot of time and money. Uh, and then on the right, we have a mating disruption band. So kind of similar to a pheromone lure, this is putting out that plume, that scent of the female, and it's just put all over the orchard so that it confuses the male moss and the uh, less mating happens. It's traditionally been used in pretty large orchards, but we've been trialing it at some of our orchards in Philly uh, to treat the or oriental fruit moth, and, and we've been happy with the results so far and are going to keep expanding that. And then there's bagging fruit. Uh, this can be pretty good, another good treatment for uh, preventing coddling moth and oriental fruit moth from laying their eggs in the fruit. 
we do it at thinning time uh, when you have thinned everything off and you have the fruitlets that will be left to mature you add the bags at that point and the fruit will just mature and fill up inside that bag on um, there's different things you can use for bagging on the left we just see some ziploc bags you cut the corners off to allow for some airflow and then just tighten it around the stem that works really well on the right they're using paper bags with twist ties there's also some proprietary like nylon socks you could put on them. This is a common technique in Japan and we found it to be very effective. And then there's trunk banding. This is displaying two different types of uh, trunk banding. On the left, it's a sticky band uh, for spotted lanternfly um, and their nymph stage when they're jumping. Uh, it's uh, hard to say if it's very effective or more at reducing populations or maybe more helpful as a monitoring tool. Um, also, it catches many more things than just spotted lanternfly, both beneficial and pests. And then on the right, we have a cardboard band, and this is uh, used as a place, an alternative place for pests to lay their eggs. The inside of that crinkly cardboard is like a safe, cozy spot for pests to lay their eggs. They, during different times of the year, they're crawling both up the tree to lay eggs in the fruit and uh, down the tree to lay in cracks in the bark and in the soil. And instead, they could, will be attracted to lay their eggs in this cardboard band. And so then what you'll come and do is every two weeks, take off the band, dispose of it, and replace it with a new one. Um, we haven't seen a lot of data of how effective this is on reducing populations, but it's a pretty low impact, easy way. Um, to try. But then diatomaceous earth, uh, we've seen this mostly used in vegetable production, but you can also use it in fruit trees. It's uh, fossilized diatomes or microorganisms that kind of just looks like a white powder, but to a soft bellied insect, it is very sharp edged and will lacerate them and kind of have a tragic ending. Um, it could be used specifically for treating peach tree borer, kind of made into a paste or a paint and put around the trunk and it will lacerate the peach tree borer. And then bird deterrence. We see the birds uh, hitting the blueberries and the cherries the hardest. And so these are a couple of different methods of deterring them. Probably the least effective is the bird, the scare bird, or hanging CDs or scare tape in your orchard. You should, um, the birds kind of get used to them quickly. So you want to wait until your fruit is almost ready to put them out. And then you kind of want to change their location and method pretty often. Um, then we have mulberries. Birds prefer mulberries to just about anything else. They're the sweetest of all the fruit. Uh, they have the same harvest season as cherries and blueberries. And so they're kind of like a distraction. Come eat this instead of that. Though, of course, they will go and have some of that too. Um, and then sugar water spray. Uh, birds can't digest sucrose. And so uh, we haven't tried it, but we've heard this is a good way to deter, deter them. And that grape Kool-Aid is even better because some of the chemicals are in there that are in the Kool-Aid also deter the birds. Um, and then netting here on the bottom left is the most effective way that we've seen, just physically barrier keeping them out. This is some blueberries with some simple PVC uh, and then netting over top of that. Uh, squirrels and groundhogs. We don't have the answer to this, but um, dogs can be helpful. Um, planting your trees not near other mature trees to kind of create a squirrel super highway. You want to have more in the middle of the field type of trees would uh, have less squirrel pressure because squirrels do not want to run through those open fields and maybe get uh, predated on by those hawks and other predator birds. 
Uh, there's also motion censored sprinklers. We tried this at the Woodlands in 2020 and found it pretty effective for groundhogs and deer, but less effective for squirrels. And really, if folks have good ideas for squirrels, we would love to hear them. Uh, orchard fencing. For deer, fencing seems pretty necessary when they're when the trees are young, you can get away with individually fencing the trees, but as they get mature, that becomes impractical um, because the deer's reach is so high, your individual fences would be have to be too high and your tree form would be off. Um, and so then you're having to fence the entire orchard, which can become pretty costly. And with what we're doing, planting community orchards, it's also what kind of messaging is that giving to your neighbors to have the whole thing cut off? Um, which brings us to sharing with the community. All of us have probably experienced being about to harvest our thing and then it's gone when we want to come and harvest it. And so what we've come to find is the best way is to just to more talking, more communication, of course. Uh, we've come up with these signs that are also all free to download from our website. Um, but just something like try a sample, but leave some for the rest of us, inviting people to come in and participate, join us for the harvest and share it with us, or just that it's not ready yet, it'll taste better later. So it's just some thoughts we have. Um, and now I'm going to pass it off to Phil and he's going to take us through the holistic and organic sprays. Thanks, Corey. Uh, so the sort of main point I want to get across to start us off with sprays is that with these common fruits, the stone and foam fruits, they are extremely challenging to grow in this climate uh, without spraying. And organic orchards in general do not mean no spray orchards. Or commercial organic orchards are spraying just as much and sometimes even more than other types of orchard. They're just spraying different things. And so, um, you know, even if you, you know, follow our recommendations in, in terms of approach and a holistic, uh, making the healthiest soil ecosystem for your fruit trees, you're still going to get periodically some challenges uh, on these common fruits. Um, so just be aware of that as, as you're uh, thinking about how you're going to maintain your orchard. And we'll, we'll talk a lot more in, in Pop Core 4 about you know, options for plants that don't need a lot of spraying or other attention. But, uh, but we're focused today on the, the common fruits, which are the ones with the most challenges. Um, so yeah, there are basically two types of organic sprays we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to start off in this section with holistic sprays that are really focused on boosting plant health and therefore resilience to pest and disease and other challenges. And then there are targeted sprays for control of specific pest and diseases. And we'll present those ones with the pest and disease sections. So uh, just some, some basics about spraying. You will always want to follow instructions for mixing an application. Very important to have the proper effect and not to do damage to your plants or, or uh, people around you. Uh, avoid spraying in the heat of day. Morning is usually the best time. Uh, early evening can be an alternate time, but generally you want to avoid spraying when it's hot out, uh, you want to avoid spraying when pollinators are active. So generally, we avoid spraying uh, trees when they're in flower in the spring. Um, you want precise timing. So you, you really need to understand insect life cycles. You also need to know, you know what stage um, your trees are at in terms of bud and flower development, petal fall. These are all in, involved in finding the right time for certain sprays. And repeat applications are often necessary. I mean, in a commercial setting, they're often repeat spraying on seven to day, seven to ten day intervals, um, which may be a bit more than a lot of us want to take on. But just to be aware, it's it's often not a oh, spray one time and your problem is eliminated. Uh, be aware that rain washes many sprays off the tree, uh, so you may need to think about reapplication after after a rain. Next slide. Four things to know. Most organic sprays, in fact, I think everything we're talking about today does not require an applicator license. So that's not something you have to worry about. Um, again, knowledge of each spray and pest and disease life cycle is required. 
Organic sprays uh, can still be harsh and toxic, and, and we'll talk about a couple that uh, uh, that do take a little more uh, a caution in how you use them and when you use them. Be aware of persistence and breakdown in the environment that depends on the particular spray, so that's something to be aware of when you're researching and deciding what to use. Spray drift, of course, we're spraying this in the air. What is nearby that could be impacted? Is it windy? Maybe find a different day if you've got a very windy day. And maybe some sites, especially in the city, are not, not going to be appropriate for spraying or spraying certain things. Um, there's a, you know, a lot more uh, potential human impact. And you will definitely, if you're out spraying something, you're very likely to get questions from your, your neighbors. So be, be prepared for that. Um, Re-entry periods depend on spray. So, um, you know, often it takes the time for, for a, a spray to dry on the plant. Um, so ones that do have a harsher impact, you might think about restricting access to the space while you're spraying or in, in the period after. Notify others, consider signage about it. Um, there's also something called a pre-harvest interval, which is something you want to think about when you're getting fruit that's close to ripening. It depends on the spray, but there's recommendations for uh, please, you know, don't spray this within a certain number of days before you harvest and eat. Um, employ full coverage at recommended rates. Uh, you, you know, you, you really, if you're applying a spray, you want to have it have a real impact, which means full coverage on the tree, use the recommended rates. Um, think about what's in your spray tank, whether you're using a backpack sprayer or, or something smaller. Uh, you may need to think about having more than one if you're using different things. Uh, so, you know, you wouldn't want to use your a sprayer for um, something harsh like um, uh, copper sulfur mix and then use that same sprayer later on for uh, a live compost tea. Those are not going to be very compatible. So be, be aware of that. Think about that. Maybe have two separate sprayers for different purposes. Um, Yes, yeah, spray rotations as well. As, you know, if you if you really are taking on a more intensive spray regimen for some of the more challenging fruit to grow, uh, think about rotating what what you're using to control a particular challenge. Um, so you're not uh, having pests build up resistance to a particular um, spray. And those are our basics of uh, things you need to consider when deciding what to spray. So I'm going to start off with the holistic sprays, uh, compost tea. So uh, in this section, I'm going to talk about all sprays that we generally recommend to everyone because they are going to boost the health of your tree and your, the ecosystem that supports it, and therefore, uh, you know, healthier, more resilient trees producing better fruit. So compost tea is a wonderful way to boost soil life, fertility, and colonize um, your soil, but also potentially your plant with beneficial fungi and microbes. Uh, and it's a way to build tree and ecosystem health and resilience. Um, and you can see a little five gallon setup here, but basically the, the concept of compost tea is that you will uh, submerge some compost in water. In this case, it's, uh, you can see a little bag dangling there um, uh, with some compost in it. And then that is aerated. Uh, so there's a, an air pump there you can see on the chair and a part you submerge in the, the, the bucket and that constantly aerates the tea. You want aerobic conditions uh, with constant oxygen for your microbes to multiply. And then there's other ingredients that go in there. So you always uh, essentially, you, it's absolutely important that you include some molasses, which is the, the sugars that actually feed the microorganisms to multiply. And then we often use some uh, a mycorrhizum mix of beneficial fungi. Um, uh, we'll talk about EM1, but using effective microbes within this mix is a really effective thing to do. And then you might also include some liquid seaweed uh, and liquid fish and humic acid and other things that, that help to feed those microorganisms. But basically, you're going to greatly multiply all these microorganisms in the water, and then after brewing for 12 to 18 hours usually, then you'll spray it onto your orchard or your garden. Um, 
you know, if you want to see the greenest lawn you've ever seen, spray some compost tea on your lawn. Uh, it's going to be beneficial to your to your plants and ecosystem. So in the holistic orcharding, uh, which is based on the work of Michael Phillips, who I was very uh, sad to find out uh, died last week. He's one of my mentors and one of the people that's really done the most for uh, ecological orcharding. Um, so it's a, a great loss for the community. He's got wonderful books. But anyway, um, in the holistic spray regimen that he developed and recommends, there are the four holistic sprays of spring starting at, right now actually is a good point. Um, as buds begin to swell to do a apply as a soil soap and um, and then repeat that every few weeks in the spring um, and in the so the, the follow up sprays after that first one are actually applied to applied to the tree branches uh, trunk uh, and leaves. And so the concept there is that we're we're actually colonizing the tree itself um, with beneficial microbes that then can help outcompete the pathogenic or disease-causing microorganisms. So you're basically helping to build an immune system and support the immune system of the tree uh, through those sprays. And then the other time of year where we'd most recommend a uh, compost tea spray is, is late fall after leaf drop. Uh, again, apply it to the soil or to the fallen leaves. So uh, Michael Phillips includes, you know, other other components with that spray. Um, so his also combines neem, um, fermented herbal teas, and other things, all with that that goal of um, colonizing the, the tree with beneficial microbes. So effective microbes. So this is an option if, if you don't have the equipment or the time to brew your own compost tea, which we highly recommend if you can. This is a commercial product that does much the same thing. So it's a commercially available microbial brew. There's EM1 is the, I think the, the first brand that came out with this, but there are others available as well. Um, but it's a, a mix of beneficial bacteria and fungi um, that functions in much the same way as compost tea. So you're competing with the pathogens, um, you're creating a barrier for them, uh, some, some of these uh, beneficial microorganisms also produce antibiotics or toxins. Uh, some of them um, parasitize or, or predate on pathogens. And basically, you're going to induce resistance and systemic plant defense. Uh, so it's a like compost state, a, a way to really boost your, your plant's ability to defend itself. Um, and yeah, so next slide. Then we have neem oil, which I'm glad to see quite a number of people have uh, at least experimented with applying that. But neem is another one that we, we highly recommend. Um, and it can have beneficial effects whether or not you have any particular pest or disease issue. So neem is derived from the neem tree, originally from South Asia, but now grown in other parts of the world as well. Uh, and there are multiple ways to apply it, and it has multiple ways that, that it can benefit you. So uh, during the growing season, we're, we apply it as a 2% spray. So that's 2% pure neem oil, which is our preference. There are some derived products as well, but using the pure neem oil at 2%, you need a little soap in there. So the oil and water uh, stay mixed. And it, it has some antifungal and tree immune system support properties that recent research has, has shown is, is, uh, can be very useful. Again, maybe similar to Compost tea and, and EM1, it's, it's uh, helping to boost your tree's immune system. At the same time, it has a um, great effect on insects. It deters many chewing insects. It also, at the same time, suppresses molting of many insects, so their ability to advance from one life stage to another. And it has use for many different things, uh, among them coddling moth, plum curculio. Um, and then we also recommend it as a dormant oil spray, although in this case, it's really just asked acting as a physical smother uh, for insect eggs. And so you could use any horticultural oil, even uh, vegetable oil from your kitchen can be used in this way uh, at 4%, a little uh, heavier um, mix and spray it all over your tree while it's dormant. So this is a great time right near, right now, end of winter, 
um, spray it all over your trunk and branches, and it'll smother a lot of overwintering insect eggs. It's particularly useful for a lot of your really tiny insect pests like aphids, scales, mites um, that overwinter on the bark of the tree. Um, yeah, and like I said, there are some derivative products that sort of isolate the active ingredient. But we think for the best holistic effect, using pure neem oil is the, the way to go. And we're going to take a break for questions. Um, I didn't see uh, any questions in the chat. Did we have any that I missed? If not, we can keep going. I guess I have a, a random question. Um, sure. So um, I have a fig tree who grows um, nearby a mulberry tree. Um, and I have found that the birds are far more interested um, in the mulberries than the figs, which has been a pleasant surprise because other figs I've had have definitely had like competition from birds. Um, but I guess I'm curious if there are like other examples of almost, um, like that decoy effect. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are like other examples of like, we know that this plant is just like so beloved that it can be like an attractor to other, um, either bugs or birds. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a lot in mind in terms of like other fruit that uh, might uh, pull your your uh, pests elsewhere. Um, I mean, we generally recommend you know planting very diverse orchards. Uh, so you're you know if you have particular challenges on one plant, you're not likely to lose all your production. But um, certainly in terms of uh, you know companion planting, that that is approach that organic farmers sometimes use to have some trap plants uh, that pull off insects. I don't know if Michael or Corey have any specific other examples in mind um, they could share on that. I, I could add a little Michael Phillips tip, which um, involved trap trees, specifically for plum curculio where he was treating, you know, protecting most of his trees, but leaving one tree untreated, which is then more attractive to the pest. And then once the pest is active in that one untreated tree, then going at that tree with everything you've got. Um, so, so that's another way to look at it as well. That's a Thanks. great one. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think I saw another question in the chat. Here. Um, yeah, one of the questions to... was, um, if you have a hot compost system, can you compost the mummified fruit or the cardboard bands? Yeah, um, hot compost definitely can be effective. Um, for that purpose, and and but for those not familiar, hot compost is is one that uh, is turned regularly, so it's getting up to a certain level of heat, and therefore will, you know, cook and kill the insect pests uh, and disease pathogens rapidly. If you have you know just a place where you pile your compost in the corner of your yard or or site, and you don't do much with it, it's probably not going to decompose quick enough to be effective. So in that case, you would definitely want to uh, do something else with the fruit, either, you know, bag it up and remove it from the site, or um, in some cases you could bury it very deeply or burn it uh, or other options. And I saw there was Oh, there is a question about question. compost tea. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the question was, can you use non-aerated compost tea if you don't have equipment for aerating? And the answer to that is, it is no. Um, basically, an unaerated compost tea uh, 
is going to kill all of your beneficial microorganisms. Anaerobic conditions will favor uh, a lot of microbes that you don't want. So it actually could be a, a net negative to apply that. Um, so if, if, yeah, I would, if you can't make compost tea, I would go with the effective microbes product, or, you know, you can just apply, um, you know, some, with some benefit, some, uh, a mix of uh, seaweed and, and liquid fish uh, to your plant and will, will be helpful in some, to some degree. You can also, you know, apply, instead of the soil soak of compost tea in the spring, spread some compost around the base of your tree. We'll have some of the same effect. So um, I don't know if we got more, to everything. Phil, there was one more question one more in the question. chat, which was okay. um, whether thyme and corn oil combined would be an effective insecticide for fruit trees. So I don't know um, if it means like dry or a fresh thyme. Um, I have not heard of that combination. Yeah, I mean, certainly oil could be used as a, a dormant oil spray. Uh, I have not heard of thyme specifically. I know that Michael Phillips has used a lot of different herbs in his sprays, but I don't know anything specifically about thyme being used. And uh, we had a question about another question about compost tea. Can you easily make a system? Yeah, I mean, the, that one that you saw in the photo for a five gallon bucket, you can order those for it's either 60 or 80 bucks. It's not, they're not expensive, but you can also reuse, um, you know, aeration parts from a fish tank. So you can easily, you know, you'll find a lot of DIY things online for how to make your own, but they're not, they don't, they're not expensive. You're mainly paying for that air pump. All right, we're going to move on to orchard pests. Hi, everyone. So there are lots of orchard pests, but we're going to review the most common orchard pests that we see at our pop orchard sites. Um, so we'll briefly cover signs and symptoms of pests in your orchard. Um, we'll talk a little bit about their life cycle, which is important to know because when you know the pest life cycle, you know when to interrupt the cycle and remove them when they're at their most vulnerable. Um, and we've already talked about a bit about different pest management techniques and sprays. So we'll kind of just briefly list off um, different um, pest management um, methods um, to go with these uh, common orchard pests. So first we have our oriental fruit moth. Um, this is one of the pests that we see causing the most damage at our pop orchards around the city. Um, so this pest will commonly impact stone fruit. Um, signs of this pest is usually a gray moth pictured on the bottom right hand corner. Um, biggest sign you'll see is something called flagging, which is pictured at the top right corner. So flagging is when the first generation larva uh, enter the twig near the tip of a new shoot and they bore into this new tissue, which will cause wilting. Um, you can also notice a gummy substance oozing out of a hole in your developing fruit as pictured on the top left-hand corner. So with the life cycle of the oriental fruit moth, the adults will typically emerge in May. Um, that first generation larvae will attack the shoot tips, they'll flag. And then following generations after will actually attack the fruit as pictured in the bottom left-hand corner. And these generations attack all through summer, um, all the way to September, October. Um, when this happens, the fruit will drop and the caterpillars will exit the fruit and overwinter in the soil before reemerging the following spring. So for pest management, um, 
you can do sprayable, sprayable, um, sprayable pheromones or hand applied dispensers for mating destruction, like Corey had been talking about earlier. Um, you can prune out, or we recommend pruning out those wilted um, flagged uh, twigs. And you wanna remove and destroy infected fruit on the tree and um, under the tree that have dropped. Um, you can also apply a neem oil to smother eggs and larvae. And you can um, do a trunk band. So you can wrap cardboard around the trunk to trap the larvae. Um, and then as mentioned before, you can do a soil cultivation for the oriental fruit moth. Next. So after oriental fruit moth, plum curculio is another big orchard pest we see around the city. I myself have seen the effects of a plum curculio literally take out entire plum trees. Um, so they affect plums, but can also affect apples, peaches, apricots, and cherries. Um, the biggest sign of plum curculio will be a crescent-shaped scar that appears after the weevil insect lays its eggs into the fruit. So that picture on the top left corner, you see those little kind of like crescent moons, that's plum curculio. Um, that's the scarring after um, it's um, planted the eggs um, and the little like uh, larvae has fed in through the fruit. So once the larva is feeding, this will cause the fruit to drop and decay. Um, with the life cycle of the plum curculio, the weevil will overwinter in ground litter, um, in soil, or specifically in hedges that border a road or a field. Um, they usually start getting active around apple tree blossoming. So this is anywhere between mid-April through mid-May. Um, and they emerge as adults during a four to six week period in the spring. And something really interesting is that 40 to 60% of that emergence can happen in one single day. Um, once they emerge, they feed on the tree buds, they feed, they feed on the flowers, and they'll feed especially on new set fruit. Um, they then lay their eggs, and they then um, mate and lay their eggs, and the eggs will hatch and mature in about two to 12 days. And then the little grub, as you see in the lower left hand corner there, um, will bore into the fruit during a two to three week period. Once the fruit falls and the larvae pupate, um, they'll do that for about two to 12 days. They then hibernate in the soil. Um, and then you see here on the bottom right hand corner, the little grub inside the fruit. So once you see that crescent shape on the fruit, you can rest assured that you more than likely will have wormy fruit. Um, so you want to definitely um, manage that um, by removing any fruit that you see with that crescent shape. Um, in the early spring, uh, Corey was talking about the shake method. So while the adults are emerging, they're very clumsy. Um, you want to shake that. Um, and you typically do that two times a day for that two to three week period. And you can also apply a kale and clay. Um, but only apply the kaolin clay after 75% of the flowers have fallen. And this is typically about five days after they bloom. Um, through the spring and summer, again, you wanna gather um, any um, fallen fruit um, and you wanna do this every other day to prevent the larvae from tunneling into the ground because um, they only need a tunnel about one to three inches below the soil surface. Um, and then in the fall, you can spray beneficial nematodes to control the larvae. Um, and again, you really have to be diligent with cleaning any debris, um, so fallen fruit and leaves to reduce that overwintering. So next we have our coddling moth. So this is the classic worm in the apple that everyone is so familiar with. Um, this will affect apples, pears, and walnuts. Um, signs of coddling moth are usually small brown moths um, pictured on the bottom right hand corner and you see on top they kind of have this coppery sheen um, at the tips of their wings. Um, signs of it on fruit, you'll usually see caterpillar drip droppings or poop, it's called frass, um, at the entrance of a hole at the fruit. Um, and again, it'll you know, if you bite into the apple or cut into it, you'll see like a little worm coming out. You can rest assured that that's more than likely coddling moth. Um, so their life cycle, they overwinter in bark 
in the soil at the trunk base too as well. Um, March through April, the adults will emerge and lay about 30 to 70 tiny disc-shaped eggs onto the fruit. So quite similar to the plum curio. Um, the larvae will burrow into the fruit, which will again, it will cause it to drop. Um, so for preventative measures, um, you can apply pale and clay. Um, you can do the trunk banding to trap the larvae before they get into the soil. And we usually recommend maybe banding around early June and then removing it and replacing it in mid-July um, and then removing that second band during late fall. Um, and again, same as with the plum curculio, if you see damaged fruit, um, you wanna pick it up and dispose of it as soon as possible. Now we have our peach tree borer. Um, so this is important to mention because this is the only insect that can rapidly kill your tree. Um, it affects peaches and other stone fruit, but we're gonna also just focus on the greater peach tree borer. Um, so signs of this, the biggest sign is that you'll have holes at the base of your trunk and it will be oozing like a gummy substance. Um, and you'll see some of that caterpillar dropping that frass. It'll kind of look like sawdust. Um, so their life cycle is that the larvae are active July through fall, um, and then they lay eggs on the lower trunk. The larvae will then bore into the trunk and consume the cambium layer, um, which is responsible for the secondary growth of stems and roots. So this can rapidly kill your tree. Um, you can prevent the peach tree borer by cultivating the soil to kill the caterpillars, um, removing any loose bark, um, and treating your tree with a preventative neem trunk spray and beneficial nematodes. So aphids in scale, I saw in the um, poll that a lot of people have been dealing with this particular pest. Um, both aphids and scale are a part of the Hemiptera order. Um, so they're tiny insects that suck the sap from the leaves and cause plant stress. Um, and this can look like anything from curled distorted leaves and flowers to distorted looking fruit. Um, they can also sometimes spread viruses and their droppings can lead to something called sooty uh, mold on leaves. So with aphids, their life cycle, um, there is a wingless female called a stem mother, and she can produce asexually through the summer and build a colony of living young, um, as opposed to just laying eggs. Um, when a plant becomes overcrowded with the offspring, some of them will develop into adults with wings and fly off to new plants to feed. Um, in the late summer, males and females are produced and they mate and the females lay eggs that survive through the winter. With scale, they, there's many species of scale. I believe there's about 3000 different species of scale in North America, um, but in general, they can produce sexually or asexually. So they can either lay eggs or live offspring. Um, their eggs will overwinter under protective covering and then will emerge between late May, early June, um, and they'll come out as little nymphs. Um, so they're crawlers that are usually found under branches or leaves or the side of tree trunks. Um, once they're settled on a feeding location, the female crawlers become immobile um, and they just stay in the same location for the rest of their lives. Um, the female um, scale will also start secreting and building this waxy protective covering, which can sometimes make them a little difficult to remove. Um, and the males will eventually molt into small insects that fertilize the females. And depending on the weather conditions, they may produce between one to four generations. Um, when it comes to management with aphids in scale, um, uh, they're often naturally controlled by beneficial predators like soldier, soldier beetles um, or parasitic wasps or lady beetles. Um, but as Corey had mentioned much earlier, you can do a water spray to just kind of spray them off your tree. Or if you have um, a really intense infestation, you can apply a neem oil. Um, in late winters around this time, this is a great time to apply a dormant oil um, to smother any overwintering eggs. 
And this is one that, again, very familiar with. It's the um, infamous spotted lanternfly. Um, we do see this everywhere, but um, we mostly see the impact of the spotted lanternfly on grapevines. Um, so similarly to aphids and scale, they'll feed on plant sap um, and also secrete a honeydew that can lead to the growth of sooty mold. Um, with their life cycle, the female spotted lanternfly will lay eggs um, between September through May on almost any surface. So trees, cars, lumber, outdoor furniture, you name it. Um, and they'll lay about 30 to 50 eggs. Between April through October, you'll see the nymphs. So the bottom left-hand corner, I think, I feel like everyone here has probably seen it, but if you haven't, they're red and black with these little white polka dots on them. Um, and also on the top here, we'll see them. They're sometimes black and white when they're first emerging. Um, they can't fly, but they jump very quickly. Um, and then between July and November, um, that's when they're in their adult stage and they'll start using their mouth parts to pierce and access sap from the plant. So with management, um, during pruning, and I've been seeing this myself at sites, um, you'll see on trees, especially underneath the bark of trees, um, the lower right-hand corner here, you see these cases. It almost looks like there's like dust on the, the tree bark here. Um, and when you scrape it off, it, it sometimes be a little gooey, but you wanna scrape that off. Um, and you're typically supposed to scrape it off into like alcohol, like a little baggie of alcohol. Um, so you can do that through the winter and early spring. Um, and it's pretty easy to spot. I recommend doing that while you're pruning. Um, you, and also, um, as mentioned before, install sticky bands to capture the emergent nymphs and adults. Um, and then you can squash any that you see, any nymphs or adults that you see throughout your orchard space. Um, another thing that we like to mention is that the tree of heaven is the host plant for the spotted lanternfly. So if you have this near your site and you can remove it, we definitely recommend that you do. And then we have our Japanese beetle. Um, so this pest can impact more than 300 plant species. Um, but we mostly see these on sweet cherry trees and grapes. Um, this is a serious pest both as a larvae and as adults um, because the larvae can feed on the roots and the adults basically feed on everything else, the leaves, the flowers, and the fruits. Um, so basically the grubs will overwinter about eight to 10 inches deep into the soil during the early winter. And then April through May, the grubs will rise to the surface and feed on those roots. Um, and a sign of this is typically, you'll see large brown patches of grass, like near or around your tree. Um, by July, the adults will emerge to feed, um, mate and lay eggs. Um, and the adults only live 60 days. So they feed intensely between July and August. Um, there are lots and lots of, um, pest management um, things to do for the Japanese beetle, um, but some of them will include neem oil, uh, nematodes, uh, bacterial parasites, parasitic wasps, or diversifying plantings to reduce potential feeding. So planting things like lilac or white ash, um, red maple or white poplar. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Phil who can discuss more about um, orchard um, sprays for um, our orchard pests. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about sort of sprays we might use for particular um, pest types of pest outbreaks uh, and starting with the, the sort of least negative impact and working towards ones that we need to be more cautious with. So kaolin clay could almost be considered a, a holistic spray uh, in that uh, it really has no negative environmental impact. It's a micronized clay particles, particle, so very, very tiny particles of clay that you spray onto your tree. Um, it, it doesn't impact the photosynthesis, lets all the light through, and is a physical barrier to many pests. So it's uh, when a pest lands on the tree, uh, the tiny clay particles get in their eyes and all their body parts. It's very uncomfortable. 
doesn't actually kill them, but they fly away. Uh, so um, mostly used in the spring, uh, three applications after petal fall. Um, again, this, this is a wash off in the rain, so beware of that in your timing. Uh, but um, it can really be helpful for a lot of our, our most common uh, um, insect pests, including coddling moth, punctoculio, oriental fruit moth, apple maggot, and others. So um, this is definitely something worth trying out uh, with really no negative impacts. And another uh, low impact one are beneficial nematodes. So nematodes are very tiny microscopic worm-like creatures that occur in the soil. Um, some of them are bad. Some can, can uh, have negative effects on eating your plants, and things like that. But there are um, beneficial nematodes that you can purchase products of that uh, are targeted and uh, parasitize certain insects primarily in their underground larval stages. So mostly you're spraying them at the, the soil at the base of the tree. There are some that can be used for peach tree borer where you, during their active season, actually spray it on the, the trunk itself. Um, but uh, basically they, they will uh, attack and, and kill some of your, your pest insects. Um, it may, they may also affect some other insects, but you'll see uh, on each, you know, Sprain that's available, a, a list of which insects are impacted by that particular nematode. So um, they can be used for plum curculio, or into fruit moth, coddling moth, tree borers. Uh, we actually started just to start experimenting with this last fall with our first application, seeing if we could have an impact on uh, plum curculio and oriental fruit moth in particular, but uh, too soon for us to let you know how it worked for us. And then we get into um, sprays that are, are more targeted. Um, so BT, you may be familiar from BT or also used in mosquito dunks, but there's a different strain of it that is used uh, in, in orchards for control of caterpillar species. So the nice thing about the, the BT, which is a naturally occurring soil bacteria of Bacillus thuringiensis, is that it only affects that, that category of, of insects. So you're not going to affect your bees or other pollinators or other beneficial insects. For the most part, you're pretty safe with this. Um, again, it would be something that you only apply in response to a, a specific outbreak uh, of, of a pest. And again, you can see a lot of our worst orchard pests are, are caterpillar species, including OFM, coddling moth, tent caterpillar, and, and, and many others. Uh, and then we have spinosad is another naturally occurring bacteria. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that Latin name, but uh, is uh, another one you'd apply only in response to specific damage. This is a broad-based insecticide, so you need to be careful with it. It can hurt beneficials, um, and basically it, uh, it disrupts the digestive system of any insect it comes into contact with. Um, but uh, yeah, it can be useful on a lot of wide range of insect pests and is sold under a number of different brand names. Uh, this Captain Jack's is just one of them. Um, but yeah, it can be used coddling moth or into fruit moth, saw flies. It, it really can be used on many, many different pests. And then we have pyrethrin, which is uh, a very uh, very old, long, long used organic spray, originally derived from a certain chrysanthemum species, it is similar uh, to spinosad in that it is a broad based insecticide. Um, and pyrethrin uh, attacks the nervous system of insects and is, is a lethal uh, on contact to most insects. Um, so, again, can be used for a wide range of pests in different categories aphids, coddling moths. Um, mites and stink bugs, many other things. Um, and yeah, the little note here to be aware of the half-life. Uh, so it does have some, take some while for it to dry and therefore become inert. So you do want to be aware of that and think about when you're spraying and whether there might be beneficial insects like pollinators active in that period. So we can take a few questions if there are any. We are actually 
behind schedule here. I know Michael has a lot more content on diseases we need to get through. But if anyone has a burning question about pests, otherwise we can make more time at the end. All right, I think we're going to hand it off to Michael here. All right, well, if the bugs weren't enough, uh, we're going to go over a few of our most common orchard diseases that we find in uh, pop urban orchards, beginning with uh, brown rot. It's our single most common challenge in pop orchards, which can lead up to 50% or more crop loss. It affects nectarines, peaches, cherries, plums, and apricots. And uh, signs of this include these uh, wilted and browning flowers initially, um, followed by gummy substance near flowers and fruitlets. And then the uh, signature sort of fuzzy brown spots and fuzzy fruits. Um, and furthermore, stem and, ling, uh, stem and limb cankers. The, the life cycle of this disease um, is that it overwinters on fruit mummies in the tree and on the orchard floor um, and in infected twigs and cankers. The, uh, the infections can occur in cool to warm wet conditions. Um, and the first primary infection occurs at bloom by airborne spores that travel far. Um, after this, secondary infections happen throughout fruit development. It's aided by insects, uh, the weather, and fruit to fruit contact. So, controls of this would be to remove the mummies in winter um, and, and when you notice infections throughout the season to prune out cankers um, and to control your insect pests. Um, you could apply fungicides in the dormant season, uh, fungicides at uh, bud break and at various flower developmental stages. And then again, after petal fall on seven to, eight, seven to 10 day intervals until the harvest, which is more of a commercial orchard spray regimen um, commonly used for brown rock control. But um, preventative measures could include applications of biofungicides uh, and your holistic sprays, and then your cultural controls as well. Next, we have fire blight. This is also one of our most common challenges, which can quickly kill a tree within a few seasons, if not managed. It affects apples, pears, Asian pears, quinces, hawthorns, and occasionally Juneberry. Um, the signs of this are leaves dying back at the terminal shoot ends and this sort of signature shepherd's crook bent over twig um, end. Uh, and then also the, the stems and leaves look charred or burnt where the infection occurs. And you can notice oozing from branches, fruit or leaves. Um, infected flowers will wilt and brown. And just a side note, there is a lookalike disease um, called Pseudomonas blight that occurs in late fall. So if you're only seeing this sort of symptom in late fall, it may be this other blight. The life cycle is that um, a bacteria infects the blossoms and new shoots, which becomes systemic and then travels towards the trunk and can kill the tree. It overwinters at the base of spurs and in infected shoots and spreads short distance by wind and rain from nearby infected material. Um, it's really only spread long distance by people um, or bugs. Um, that can include infected materials like your pruning tools or transporting living plants that are already infected. And then it can also spread from plant to plant by pollinators and other insects. It does need to enter through a wound or a flower. Um, and occurs in warm and humid to wet weather 
And um, typically in your newer growth, not in uh, wood over two years old. Um, controls would include uh, pruning out the cankers at least eight to 12 inches below where you see signs of it. Then when you make that cut, check the stem at the end where you made the cut. And if it's discolored, cut lower until you find clean wood. Um, you want to prune in dry weather with no rain in the forecast to protect your cuts and remove all of the infected material from the site. Bury it deep, burn it, or throw it in the trash. Get it away. Um, preventatively, plant, you can plant resistant cultivars. Uh, you can do applications of serenade or go as far as commercial applications of preventative copper and lime sulfur. Um, you're going to want to control aphids and leaf hoppers that um, can be a major vector for this disease. Next, we have um, fungal and bacterial cankers uh, and gamosis, which is very common on our stone fruit. Um, just a note, gamosis is the gooey symptom that you see here, and that is not the disease. Um, this gooey substance can turn black. Um, you can also notice sunken lesions, yellowing or wilting new shoots and leaves. And if left to go, whole branches and the tree could die if uh, cankers aren't managed. For the life cycle, uh, fungal canker overwinters on dead wood or sunken lesions. Spores are distributed by wind and rain splash, entering through insect damage, pruning cuts, dead shoots and buds, and other injuries. Um, and the trees are most susceptible short after breaking dormancy. And this is why many people prune their peaches after bloom further into the season with a quicker healing time. Infections can occur, occur in early spring, fall, and winter um, with symptoms prevalent in hot weather. Um, just as a comp comparison, the bacterial canker infects more so in cool wet spring weather through wounds and is also found on buds um, in addition to infected twigs and cankers. It has a distinct sour smell and may cause twig and fruit spur dieback and kill buds developing into cankers first at that location. Um, controls include carving out cankers back to healthy tissue preferably in high and dry, uh, hot and dry weather, pruning out infected material, removing that, burning it, burying it, or throwing it in the trash, and the application of fungicides. Preventatively, um, it's good to do thoughtful, formative pruning, pruning the young stone fruit trees to avoid future big cuts, which are a source of infection. Um, you want to thin your fruit to prevent branches from breaking. You want to manage your insect pests like borers and oriental fruit moth, control brown rot as well, which can be an entry point. Um, and then also consider pruning after bloom in warm, dry weather, planting resistant and hardy varieties, and planting far away from infected trees. You could also consider fungicides uh, right after pruning to protect those cuts. Um, next, we have black knot. Uh, we are seeing this increasingly in Philadelphia orchards affecting plums and cherries. Uh, the signs are most noticeably in winter, these black sort of hard and brittle, abnormal, warty growth. Um, the young knots are actually soft, velvety, and olive green, turning hard and black by autumn. And these knots create spores in their second season. So if left untreated, it can kill limbs and the whole tree. But you have a year to notice them and cut them out. Um, to control it, you want to identify it uh, before it's well established and prune out these knots at least four inches below the knot. You want to remove that from the site, 
throw it in the trash, burn it, do what you gotta do. And uh, you may consider fungicides around bloom time until warm, dry weather occurs. Preventatively, you would maybe consider removing wild prunus within 500 feet. Um, don't plant near infected plants. And in severe or commercial cases, apply fungicides before rains above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, um, very common in our orchards, we will see peach leaf curl. <laughs> Yet this is not life-threatening to the tree alone. Um, it primarily affects peaches and nectarines. It does not necessarily affect other stone fruits. The signs are this visually shocking, blistered, puckered leaves, followed by um, the defoliation, your uh, leaves falling off the tree. The life cycle includes this, the fungal disease and um, affecting the peach leaves, sometimes fruit, overwintering in the bark crevices and in the bud scales themselves. So primary infections occur from bud swell to leaf out during cool and very humid or wet weather. You may see a trend here with our humid environment in the Northeast that switches between cool and warm. Um, and back and forth all the time, promoting all of these fungal and bacterial diseases. Um, control includes fungicides in the late fall after full leaf drop, and then again in the late winter and early spring. If there's going to be a freak warming event in the middle of winter, you could consider reapplying right before that warming event. Um, and Collecting infected leaves may not prove to be effective. If it's a bad year, you're gonna to wanna to thin the fruit heavier than normal and irrigate and apply nitrogen-rich soil amendments during the season. Uh, preventatively, holistic sprays and biofungicides are a good option. And planting resistant varieties like Frost, Avalon, Pride, uh, Indian Free, and Betty is a good place to start with your variety selection. Um, next, we have cedar apple rust. Uh, this is, there are various fungal rusts affecting fruits in the rose family. Um, and we're increasingly noticing this on June berries. It affects apples, pears, hawthorns, um, and June berries, all different strains. The, um, the signs are the yellow leaf spots that start off and develop into raised orange lesions. Um, these orange galls that develop many spore horns on the fruit and leaves. Um, the life cycle, uh, this fungal disease requires an alternative host in the juniper family, including the Eastern red cedar. Um, and so this disease needs to hop back and forth between the two flat plant families to, to survive. It can travel very long distances, but uh, is primarily making infections within a hundred feet to a quarter mile. So controls would be tolerating this disease, though it can also decimate most of a Juneberry crop. You could consider spring and early summer fungicides, or hand removing galls from either host and look into removing jun juniper hosts from the immediate area to reduce infection. Preventatively, you want to look for resistant cultivars like with apples. That could include Red Free, Liberty, Williams Pride, and Freedom. Um, and Next, we have powdery mildew, which we primarily notice on grapes in Philly orchards. Um, it can affect stone and palm fruit and raspberries, many vegetables and other perennial plants. The signs of it are this gray, powdery uh, to white fuzzy substance on the leaves. Um, interestingly enough, the fungal disease um, starts at, it overwinters on the twigs and the leaves, 
and are spread by the air in warm and humid conditions. And the warm and humid conditions are needed for germination and infection, but this disease persists and flares in the dry heat after infection when it is most noticed. Um, to, to, to do controls on this, you could tolerate it as a mostly uh, cosmetic, though it does affect photosynthesis. You can literally just spray your plants with water, um, which kills and suppresses the growth of the fungus that thrives in the dry heat. Um, you can prune out infections or consider copper sulfur or baking soda. And preventatively, you're going to want to plant in full sun. Um, pruning for airflow helps a lot, uh, planting resistant varieties, and um, coating your plants in horticultural oil will provide a barrier as well. Apple scab. Um, is very common yet cosmetic and does not really mean fruit are inedible. It affects apples, hawthorns, and occasionally pears. Um, the signs are there's leaf lesions, cracked fruit, fruit dropping, um, and the corky fresh underneath the scab, um, which may develop after harvest. Uh, it's a fungal disease causing circular spots that are olive green to brown on fruit, leaves and stems beginning in spring, lasting through summer. First infections occur as velvety lesions on the underside of young leaves near blooms, um, and it can distort and drop the leaves. Secondary infections on the fruit and throughout the tree happen um, throughout the season. And it, uh, it overwinters on the fallen leaves and fruit that reinfect the tree. Um, and it requires wet and warm, not hot conditions over six hours to make an infection. Traveling by wind or rain splash only up to 100 feet. Um, so with that in mind, the leaf management is uh, an orchard sanitation are critical to managing apple scab. Um, you want to remove that infected material and consider spring and summer fungicides starting at bud swell. Um, do your pruning and plant resistant varieties like honey, crisp, and gold rush, uh, freedom and liberty, red free, and Williams pride, among many others. Um, so next I'm going to go into just a couple sprays to deal with these bacterial and fungal diseases. Uh, first is biofungicides, which is very similar to our holistic sprays, compost tea, Korean natural farming, but it's an isolated, isolated biological product. Um, some examples include serenade, which is a bacillus species attacking pathogens and inducing a, an immune response. Um, and another common one named regalia, which is actually an act, extract from giant knotweed. Next, we have copper and sulfur fungicides, which is a broad spectrum mineral fungicide. Um, it's very harsh and builds up in the environment over time. So you, you wanna be careful with it. And the application timing should consider your pollinator activity. And you wanna make sure with this and all of your sprays um, that you're wearing protective equipment for yourself, including a mask, eye protection and all of that. Um, and it is, you know, a very commonly used organic spray for your fungal issues. Um, so after all of that detailed information, I think it's important to sum it all back up in a larger overview of the ecological pest and disease management approach um, in different lines of defenses. So, your first line of defense is your site, species, and variety selection. 
um, selecting for disease resistance, buying healthy plants from a reputable nursery in the first place, and siting your plants in a place that they will be happy with full sun, airflow, and well-drained soils. Um, following that with your simple, proactive, ecological approaches, healthy soil life, beneficial insect and bird habitat, and going as far as releasing beneficial insects. And then your third line of defense being your holistic and natural sprays, boosting the immune system, uh, boosting competition with pathogens, uh, you know, your, your natural sprays that we spoke about throughout this presentation. And then your fourth line of defense would be your cultural and physical controls, your pruning, your sanitation, you know, getting diseased materials out of there, um, identifying everything correctly, using your traps and, you know, more mating disruption, your physical shaking, you know, water spraying, physical barriers um, to prevent your pests from getting to the fruit, um, fences, dogs, and signage as well. And then your last resort or your fifth line of defense would be moving into your organic sprays, uh, beginning with your kale and clay and natural diatomaceous earth and dormant oil. Um, fungicides and insect regulators. Um, and then it's important to keep track of what you did um, and evaluate how well that went for you. So this completes our POP Core 2 class on ecological pest and disease management. Our contact information is here and we can take any questions that you have on this section or the whole presentation and we would love to know what you think.